Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Business of Wellness. I am your host from Inside.com, Stephanie Zielinski, and we have an excellent event planned for you today. We have some amazing guests that are going to bring us insights into the multi-trillion dollar global wellness industry. We are going to hear from Dr. Gabe Papalardo, founder and CEO of Six Swing Studio, Nick Patel, founder and CEO of Wellable, and Oliver Ryan, co-founder and CEO of Count It Labs. We'll hear about their amazing careers, find opportunities for innovation in this space, and learn some predictions for the future. Before we get to our amazing speakers, I want to tell you about Inside.com. Our goal here is to make you smarter, build your network, and make you more successful. And we do this by providing news, networking, and community. We offer 14 different newsletters that cover the worlds of business, tech, venture capital, crypto, and more. We have free events like this every week where you can hear from the people who are building the worlds of tomorrow and discover exclusive insights and trends from industry experts. This month, we are even launching a beta social networking site for professionals, which is really going to help you build your network and community. So we will let you know when that site goes live to the public. In the spirit of community, let's interact. I'm seeing people in the Zoom chat here from North Carolina and Colorado and Australia and Michigan and San Fran. Hey, everyone. Tell us not just where you are watching from, but tell us what you do. This is a wellness event. Maybe you work in the wellness industry. Maybe you own your own wellness business. We would love to know that in the chat. And of course, give us your questions for Gabe, Nick, and Oliver. We're going to have a Q&A at the end after their presentation. So we will bring them your questions. Feel free to have conversation on the side in the chat, whether you are on Zoom or YouTube. So be, without further ado, I want to introduce one of Inside.com's analysts. Dan Smith is the writer of our Inside Daily Brief newsletter, and he's going to give us a quick overview of the wellness industry. Hey, Dan. Hey, everyone. I'm Dan, and welcome to our Business of Wellness event. We have some really fascinating guests on today, and the topic is one that I think people from many different industries and walks of life as well will be really interested in. So the topic of the business of wellness is interesting both for professional and for personal reasons. On one level, we want to talk about the wellness industry today because it's an innovative and high growth sector of the economy that deserves more attention. But we also want to know more about it because the products and services sold by companies in this space are changing the ways that we think about very, very deeply personal human topics like our physical health, our mental health, and our overall well-being. So on the business side, on the economic side, it's clear that the wellness industry is booming. A recent report by an industry group valued the global wellness economy at $4.9 trillion in 2019. That's bigger than the annual GDPs of the United Kingdom and Italy combined. This estimate takes a very broad view of the wellness industry and its definition includes such varied products and services as workout equipment, makeup, self-care software, holistic medicine, or a visit to a spa or mineral spring. While this broad definition is useful, what we're interested in here today for this event is the intersection of mental health, workplace wellness, and tech. So a major shift has happened in the last 10 years with the rise of wellness platforms, apps, and other tools for individuals and individual consumers and organizations. A broader cultural shift has led individuals to realize that they need to prioritize self-care if they want to live productive and fulfilling lives. As a result, the demand for products and services that can help with this has, have grown dramatically. There's also been a shift among businesses who are now much more conscious of the importance of encouraging healthy habits and behaviors among their employees. Wellness packages and resources have become an important draw for new talent, and self-care is now joining healthcare as a staple employer-provided benefit for workers. You have companies like Calm and Headspace who have served as, trail, as trailblazers for popularizing med meditation and positive mental hygiene in a culture that had previously regarded meditation as maybe an exotic curiosity that kind of seemed like a waste of time. Nowadays, people are much more conscious of the fact that our well-being is really the product of what we put into ourselves. And replacing 50 minutes of scrolling on social media with a brief meditation practice is something with clear and tangible benefits for our mental health, physical health, and our overall well-being. And the wellness industry isn't just about meditation. You have, you know, sleep has become a $70 billion industry in itself. And companies like Eight Sleep and Aura have succeeded in part because people are increasingly realizing that sleep quality can have a massive massive impact on their quality of life, their productivity, and their overall well-being. 
and the wellness industry's growth and expansion isn't limited to these kind of companies, but they represent some of the more visible faces in a space that has grown to encompass countless subfields and topics in recent years. So today, we have guests who've created products and tools to help customers and clients achieve their physical, relational, and mental well-being goals in really exciting new ways. In a few minutes, we're going to hear more about each of these companies, but I want to conclude with a thought for the audience to ponder about the broader trajectory of the wellness industry and its implications for society at large. So on a really personal level, we ought to acknowledge that the idea of wellness and the related notion of self-care has really expanded in the last couple of years. There's been a broader cultural shift towards talking about and acknowledging the shared challenges that we all face as individuals, whether it be through getting fit, improving our physical health, developing self-care practices like gratitude journaling or meditation to improve our mental health, or by consciously seeking out community and focusing on having positive emotional relationships with other people. This trend, which has been going on for a long time, was really accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. The emotional challenges posed by the pandemic led to a massive uptick in mental health diagnoses and, along with it, growth in our collective interests in topics of mental health and well-being. As maybe you could say that a silver lining of the pandemic is that we've all learned how important it is to be conscious of our well-being, our physical health, our mental health, and that we need to try and develop various self-care practices that work for us in helping to cope with the emotional challenges we face in life, whether it be in a time of crisis like the last two years of the pandemic or the general challenges we have you know, with our, with our families, with our businesses, everything that we're doing in life, being able to have healthy emotional regulation and management is something that people didn't talk about for a long time, but now it's something where there's a massive shift in our collective consciousness about these issues in a very positive direction. And the founders and companies that we have here today are all working to help address this in really exciting and innovative ways. And I can't wait to hear what they have to say. So Stephanie, take it away. Thank you, Dan. I cannot wait as well. I am ready to dive into it. I want to introduce our first guest. His name is Dr. Gabe Papalardo, and he has a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology. He's the founder, CEO, and creative director at Six Wing Studios. And in May 2021, Six Wing Studios released Amaru, a virtual pet that helps users with self-care and mental health. It's like Tamagotchi meets Headspace. So you check in with your pet and you check in with yourself. Gabe, thank you for being here. Stephanie, thank you so much. And Dan, I've never been teed up so well in my life. Thank you so much. This is super <laughs> exciting. So yeah, let's, uh, let's dig right into it. Share my screen here. If I could find out how. Uh, one second, there it is. And... All right, y'all see in that slide? Looks perfect. Yep. All right, great. Cool, well, thank you again. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Six Wing Studios, just to talk a little bit about how I got into this line of work. Um, as it was mentioned, I've got a doctorate in industrial organizational psychology, so I'm loving all the workplace wellness talk you're talking about, so good. Um, I have a meditation and yoga instructor background, and also I'm a suicide survivor. I lost my brother to suicide when I was 16. And anxiety and depression have just been a part of my life and my family's life as long as I've been born. So uh, I had a particularly nasty depressive episode at the end of graduate school and following graduate school and medication wasn't doing it for me. Uh, therapy wasn't doing it for me. It was actually discovering mindfulness through an app that really helped turn my, my relationship with my well-being around. And I found it to be a very empowering experience because it was something that I could do myself. So that led me on a journey to really get into the neuroscience of meditation. I actually lived on a, a yoga ashram for four months. I really got deep into this practice. And what I determined was that I really wished that this had found me earlier in life because the um, tragedy of my story is how common it is, right? So a 63% increase in depression in 12 to 17 year olds in just three years, this was a Blue Cross Blue Shield statistic from 2016. So imagine what that's looking like now post COVID, right? Uh, anxiety, ADHD, suicide, overdose, all have skyrocketed in similar ways. It's actually brought the American life expectancy going backwards for the first time in human history. So this is like not a problem that we can continue to sit on our hands about. And uh, we know that tech's part of the problem. We wanna be part of the solution. So I knew I wanted to make an impact, but I didn't know exactly how I could make something unique, something that hadn't already been done. Headspace and Calm were already getting out this tremendous self-care at scale. So how could I really help? And I arrived at gamification. So self-care, the, you know, the research is very clear practices like mindfulness, meditation, gratitude, journaling really can have a profound at a neurological level effect on rewiring your brain, 
away from stress and towards resilience, away from distraction and towards focus, but you have to stick with it. It's just like exercise. You can't just you know exercise one time. It is a practice. You have to stick with it. So I was thinking, how can we prevent drop off? How can we prevent, um, it takes about two months, for, two months for a new habit to become solid. How can we motivationally scaffold a player to keep them engaged with it until they get to that two month mark and really start to feel the benefit? And games are a perfect medium for that. So games leverage behavioral reinforcement, feedback systems, narrative to impart new skills, engage and retain players. So there's the reinforcement piece of it, little dopamine hits, but also there's this immersive story. There are these characters, there's mysteries in the world that brings people coming back over and over again. So games, I feel, are a fairly untapped way of getting out this content at scale. 60% uh, of Americans play games uh, at some point during the day, and it's a bigger industry than Hollywood. So let's explore this emerging intersection of mental health tech and gamification with gamification's primary value add here being this motivational scaffold towards retention. So on the left-hand side of the graph, we're looking at our Fortnites or Roblox or Call of Duties. These are entertainment products that have no real claim to be trying to help with any sort of mental health issue. But as we move to the right a little bit, we start seeing narrative interventions. So Hellblade and Celeste are two incredibly well-received, critically acclaimed titles uh, that both have a mental health narrative. So for instance, Celeste, looks like a Mario game. You're jumping up and down on little platforms and trying to get to a high up place. But what they've done is used a narrative rapper to say, this mountain is a metaphor for Madeline, the protagonist coming to acceptance with her self-critical voice. So, you know, it just took a Mario game, but just by using a simple narrative device really created a powerful message that's really well received. On the right side, we've got our traditional mental health, our talk therapy, our medications, those aren't going anywhere. But now we start seeing tech come into the picture, right? So better help talk space using this to technologically enable these traditional platforms. And then finally, in the bottom in the south, we've got Calm, Headspace, Insight Timer, Healthy Minds Innovations, all coming up with these wonderful content platforms. So you put all those three together and you've got my cute little Amaru chilling there with his tongue out and a couple of other projects we're going to talk about, bringing good gamification in to um, enchant our players and keep them around to get the benefit. So I'm just going to take a step back now and just broadly review. There are far more projects in this space than I can possibly talk about, but I'm just going to highlight some interesting ones. Shadow's Edge by Digging Deep, really cool project. This is a narrative therapy game that's designed to help people process grief and stress. So you're dropped into the world of Shadow's Edge, where all of the color of the world is gone. And by discovering these journal pages, you fill out these journal prompts that are guiding you through a narrative therapy exercise. But then you unlock graffiti stencils and, color and spray paint to be able to go around the town and it's an art therapy exercise of bringing color back to Shadow's Edge. Absolutely beautiful game. Um, Endeavor RX by Achille. This is the first FDA approved game for ADHD. So what they've done is they've taken different brain exercises, uh, you know, focus exercises, uh, response inhibition exercises, gamified that, shown a statistically significant improvement in ADHD symptoms, and now they're able to prescribe this game for ADHD. Helium by Storia is very cool. It goes into the wearables and VR AR space. So you put on a, a neurofeedback headband called the Muse. You put on your VR goggles and they have different experiences. But in this one, you are taming your inner animal. So your animal is stressed out, it's roaring, it's going crazy. And then it guides you through a relaxation meditation and you watch the animal calm down on screen. So a very immersive product, very cool. Bringing it to what we do at Six Wing Studios, we have created Amaru, the self-care virtual pet. This takes the best features of virtual pet games and mindfulness apps and well-being apps and brings them together. So we were responding to a motivation that we heard. This was not our first game idea. We went out on the floor of a mental health wellness conference and we just interviewed self-described gamers and we heard this common motivation. I want to get a better grip on my mental well-being so I can help other people. There was an altruism behind it. And so we were like, well, what would be the perfect game structures to support that? And we came up with Amaru because it's a game about a mutually supportive relationship. So when the player first logs in, there's this scared, adorable fantasy creature, and they set three self-care goals for themselves during the day. These can be to engage with our mindfulness content or a gratitude journal, or just anything they customize it. You can make your goal, call your mom, whatever. Log it complete. We reinforce you by showing the animal calm down on the screen. You then get to feed the pet, uh, pet the pet, uh, change its colors, play little mini games. And over a two month period of time, which is the time that we structured for a new habit to become secure, uh, you see Amaru gain uh, comfort and excitement to see you and also empowerment over its anxiety. 
So we've had about 300,000 downloads of this. We've got a 4.6 on Google Play and a 4.5 on, uh, on uh, iOS. So we're pretty excited to keep developing this product. So some lessons from the field, if you're thinking of getting involved in this, and please let me know when my time runs out because I do expect that. Um, <laughs> the player impact has been profound. We get these love letters multiple times a day. The app just prevented a full-on crisis of self-worth when it comes to work. That meditation breathing exercise definitely works well to help fight off the thoughts that cause the spiral effect. We get these every day, and it's incredible to see the people are resonating with this. And if you look on the um, on the right side here, I'm highlighting the fact that this player reported a 220 day streak, which is insane. We only developed this game to last about two months and she's actually 229 now if she's stuck with it because this is an old slide. 220 days this person has been coming in, checking in and using a MRU to boost their self care. I don't even know if I've used a toothbrush for 220 days. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. So um, some other lessons from the field is that there's many roads to revenue. Three of the products on the screen are all takes on virtual pets. We've got Finch, Ourselves with Amaru, and Cinesprite. Finch does a freemium with a subscription model. We do a free, but with in-app purchases, like the ability to customize. And in both of these products, all the self-care is free. We gamify the game component, or uh, monetize the game component. Also, because we've been, uh, invested so much in our intellectual property with our characters, we've been able to do merchandise. So these plushies have been really popular. We've done gratitude journals and art books and all sorts of cool stuff. In the future, we want to replicate a headspace model of being able to have a person buy a copy and have that donate to a, a pool of people with financial need. Uh, I think that that'll also uh, take us farther. And Cinesprite, uh, they got FDA approval, so they just bill you to their insurance. You know, you can get that one for $15, $15 a month, which is a, a really high subscription. But I guess if your insurance is paying for it, great. And Shadow's Edge is completely free because they're backed by a nonprofit. So there's many different roads to revenue here. It's kind of the wild rest. Notably missing, though, is ad-based revenue, because ad-based revenue incentivizes time on screen. So I've been very excited to see that all of these projects have walked away from ads, even though it's a very common revenue stream in games, because if you're replacing an anxiety or depression problem with a screen addiction problem, you're really not helping. So I'm very, very happy that people moved away from this. How am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, last said, yeah, if you want to take an extra... Um few moments to oh, sure i'll just get to the end of the slide good to go fantastic all right so um you may have seen this and been like wow that's really exciting like i, I was thinking of making a tech product maybe i'll just i'll gamify it okay back up there there are there are many 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 different types of games in the world and you want to think about what the core motivation of your game is before bringing that into this space i think we've all probably remembered from like education like you know oh they just turned math into a shooter game won't that make it fun like no not necessarily um, I played a game that was, uh, I used my brain to control a, a pirate ship. And I was like, if they had just made the pirate psychic, this would have made sense. Um, <laughs> so uh, with our player motivation, getting back to that notion of the, um, uh, I, I take care of myself so I can take care of something else. The virtual pet was a very natural fit for that. However, our aesthetics that we've chosen have pivoted us to 85% female and non-binary audience, which is beautiful but mental health is not isolated to female and non-binary. So if we wanted to break out into the more traditional male gamer motivations, and I know these are stereotypes, but they're borne out by the research, you know, it's, it's combat, it's wanting to be the hero, it's wanting to save the world. Those are the types of things that male gamers tend to gravitate towards. So we have ideas for games that would be very, very different from Amaru that we could use to get this content out to that player base. So how do we capitalize on the community that we've already built and not, you know, have to start from scratch? Well, you see with Mario, you know, uh, Mario's got Mario Odyssey, a very challenging platformer game, but it's also got Mario Party, which is a casual party game. Could not be more different, could not appeal to more different audiences, but everyone gets to participate in the fandom of Mario. Like everyone gets to participate with the characters, everyone gets to participate with the music, go to conventions, things like that. So that's the way that Nintendo has been very effective at creating sort of wide-reaching family brands is by having many very different mechanical games but with a common ip wrapper around them um player community uh so one thing that took us by surprise is that by branding ourselves as a mental health focused game our discord community became filled with mostly teenagers with mental health needs and that was a very big challenge for us to moderate uh so we ended up all taking a mental health first aid online training course so that we would be better at fielding them to, to professionals if we started hearing you know, suicidality or really extreme behavior. And we partnered with an organization called Guardians Mental Health that had on, um, on, uh, on Discord 
vent channels and licensed clinical therapists to talk to these people. So just don't, the community is incredibly valuable in giving you feedback, is incredibly valuable at giving you fan art and evangelism, but just know that if you wade into the space, especially in the mental health space, uh, having some resources in place to field that traffic would be good. Don't get caught flat-footed on that one. Um, lastly, I'll just say that this is hard mode. <laughs> Plan accordingly. This is a hybrid product and a hybrid market. And if you're making a game, it's got to be more fun than other games out there. And if you're making a wellness app, it's got to be better than other wellness app out there. And if you're going to make a gamified wellness app, you got to make you got to be better at both. And doing one is hard. So fund rate is accordingly. Understand that this is a long road. Um, you can't um, monetize in some of the ways that others do while staying true to mission. So you want to select uh, from investors and stuff like that. People who are very mission aligned and social impact aligned in addition to the bottom line. And um, yeah, it's been, uh, you, you not only need to know the ins and outs of designing a game and an app, but you also need to understand the distribution models of both as well. Uh, for instance, one thing that caught us a bit flat footed is that Apple lets you be a game and an app. They don't care how you classify yourself. Google draws a hard line in the sand. They say you are either an app or a game. And if you choose one or the other, you can't even get comparison metrics against the other side. So when you're a hybrid like this, you need to also be aware of the distribution model. Um, and that, that can serve you greatly. Um, wow, I actually did get all through that. That's incredible. Just throwing out that we do have investment opportunities available in this project right now. And I've got a healthy wall of links in this that I understand that Stephanie is going to be sharing with you. Um, oh, yeah. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Dave, you did fit so much into that small <laughs> amount of time. Amazing insights into this hybrid model that you've created and into the strategy behind your game. I really hope there's people in the audience that are looking into innovative mental health solutions like you've created with Amaru because you gave some great advice. Um, the audience is blowing up the chat. This is great. This is a pointer that caught me. If you're on Zoom, think about if your little blue bar is talking to everyone or talking to host and panelists, because I would hate for just us hosts to get all of this cool information about who you guys are and what you do and not you know, have everyone see that, because this is about connection and collaborating and uh, networking as well. So thank you, Gabe. I want to um, give a little intro to our next guest, who is Nick Patel. He had a past life as an investment banker and has been founder and CEO at Wellable since 2012. Wellable delivers customizable, highly engaging employee wellness programs for employers to drive a culture of wellness, improve employee productivity, satisfaction, and retention. Welcome, Nick. Thanks for being here. Sorry. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no problem. Excited for your here. presentation. Go right ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Everyone can see my screen, I'm assuming. Yes, yes. sir. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Thanks for having me uh, a little bit about myself. So we can kind of get into the meat of kind of what I want to discuss, but um, as alluded to before, uh, started my career in investment banking, all working with healthcare technology companies, um, moved into actually one of our clients at the time. So I went to go work for uh, in a product strategy role for a very large uh, healthcare technology company. It was helpful in terms of seeing how things don't move very quickly and how a uh, startup needs to be more agile and things like that, that eventually found myself into starting an employee wellness company, uh, which is called Wellable and kind of where I'll spend most of my time kind of talking about. So yeah, so I can, uh, I will talk about Wellable specifically at the end, just to give you a sense of kind of how we address the market, but I thought it would be most helpful for the audience is really thinking about the market itself. So one of the things we did at Wellable to help drive our success was understanding the specific challenges that we're trying to address. I think Dan talked about it before, is that when you look at the wellness market in general, it can be carved up in so many different ways. Um, it could be application specific, sleep, physical activity, nutrition, mental health. Um, it could be carved up by end market. So going to employers, to health plans, directly to the consumer and so forth. Um, so to help us digest that market, specifically the market that we serve, we formed a group called uh, Wellable Labs. Um, it's a separate entity. It's under our umbrella, but it's effectively an independent thought leadership organization that does research in the specific market that we're trying to address, which is employee well-being. So the concept of employee well-being kind of in a nutshell is that employers have a very strong stake in the health of their employees to the extent that they are healthier, they're you know, cheaper to insure, they are more productive, 
they are happier in their personal and professional lives. So the employer has a economic incentive beyond just the moral incentive and kind of goal of keeping those employees healthy and happy. So we launched this group to kind of study this market and to help us stay ahead of the curve. Uh, so I'm really gonna focus on specifically one uh, area of research that we do. We've done this report, um, the Employee Wellness Industry Trends Report for five years now. So this is the fifth year. We just released it in January. And uh, the real goal is to help inform the market for others externally to think about uh, what's being invested in, in terms of resources, et cetera, in the employee wellness market. What are key decision criteria that employers are thinking about as they choose to purchase or procure solutions? Um, we use it internally to help as one of our big pillars to help guide our product roadmap. So before we get into the actual findings uh, of the survey, just a little bit of kind of how we went about capturing this data. So um, every year we go out and survey brokers. So even though our end market is employers, uh, we can go out and survey, you know, 10,000 employers, or we could sub, uh, survey a subset of brokers. So if you're not familiar with how health insurance is purchased at the employer level effectively, Every company has a insurance broker. They are the conduit or middleman, so to speak, between the employer and all the health plans that serve their various regions. So if it's a Blue Cross plan, a Cigna, an Aetna, like a national insurer, whatever it may be, these brokers kind of serve as uh, the gatekeepers for all these plans. Um, there's no fee to have a broker. So almost every employer has one. Um, they get paid off commissions. And there's a whole nother conversation of whether this is a an equitable structure or, or healthy structure to have kind of in our US healthcare environment. But because they're free to the employee or the employer, almost every employer has it. So they serve as a good representation of a broad segment uh, employer. So if you talk to a broker, uh, many of which have these wellness directors, so it's employee wellness has become such a, a big topic or an area of concern for companies. Um, brokers have hired these dedicated resources who serve as really consultants, so to speak talking and working with their employer groups on creating wellness plans that meet their specific goals and objectives. So we went out to all these wellness directors at these health insurance brokers across the country and surveyed them on what they're seeing their employers and their clients looking to purchase and things like that. So just a quick snapshot of the participant profile, largely in this kind of what we call medium market, 250 to 1,000 employees. Um, most of them have 10 plus years of experience. Um, in terms of working with clients and things like that. So as I said, we've done this for the last uh, five years. So it goes all the way back to 2018. Um, this is just a summary of the last five years. And we really kind of simplify this in a very kind of simple kind of question, like in general, are these employers investing less, investing the same or investing more? And, you know, in many parts of the health and well-being market, because it's so fragmented in terms of solutions, as we noted before, in between end markets, there is high growth. So mental health, financial well-being, sleep, those areas are growing incredibly well. Um, but the market as a whole, from our experience, is largely staying flat, but it's really becoming a reallocation of dollars. And so you can see, you know, within the invest more category, the range is very tight, 35% to 37%. You're seeing the invest less grow, uh, especially in the kind of most recent years, mostly due to budget constraints and things like that. And that's really kind of eating into the status quo or investing the same. Um, but that doesn't really tell the full story. I think if you look at specific solutions across the employee well-being market, you're going to see there's wide divergence in terms of the solutions that people are investing in and growing very rapidly, as well as solutions that aren't doing so well. So we've uh, effectively went out to 25 different solutions in the employee wellness market and asked employers the exact same question. Are they investing less? Are they investing more? Are they investing the same? And we've carved out the top five as of rising stars and the bottom five as what we call falling giants. And we'll talk those about those in a bit. Um, if there's one theme as relates to the rising stars, three of the five categories relate to mental health. Um, you know, mindfulness meditation, stress management, employers, Prior to the, you know, the onset of the pandemic, we're talking about mental health, but in this post-pandemic world, this became, it became just a more popular topic. I think there's less, um, less kind of views of trying to hide it, let it live below the surface. It came to the forefront. Employers were dealing with it. Employees were dealing with it. 
And in many ways, it was a benefit that you could have a conversation about mental health in the workplace now. And that allowed companies to want to invest in technologies and other solutions to help address that. Um, the other two, um, I would say, are unique in terms of the market in the sense that the pandemic obviously closed a number of different uh, access to healthcare or changed the way we access healthcare. So telemedicine was on the rise. Um, it was always growing, but I think it had a little bit of an excess surge. And then COVID-19 vaccinations are certainly something that at the time of the survey, which was in Q4 uh, 2021, was top of mind. You had the OSHA regulation just being passed or kind of issued the ruling and things like that. The one thing I would say just in general, um, as it relates to the last two years, because everything I felt feel like now is talked about as pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, is that in many ways, and I think this applies to a lot of industries, not just employee well-being or wellness in general, is that the trends caused by the pandemic were just accelerated. Um, the example I always give is a like non-wellness one, so to speak, it's remote work. People were, people in companies were increasingly adopting remote work, but they did so at a much faster pace because they were required to um, as part of the pandemic. And I think the same thing applies. We felt that mental health, uh, financial well-being, sleep, these areas companies were investing in. And with the pandemic, they've realized the, the need for those type of solutions even more. And they just doubled down their investment and accelerated that trend that was already happening. As it relates to, to the falling giants, in many ways, we find that they're two real kind of victims of kind of this less investment. And because of the type of solutions they are, they, reckon, they reflect a bigger dollar amount of the overall wellness pie as it relates to employee well-being, and it's on-site solutions. So think of things like fitness classes, health fairs. In some cases, larger companies would have on-site clinics, so where people could, you know, get their primary care addressed within the same building or the same like kind of locations where they work. Obviously, as you can imagine, with offices being closed, things like that, these budgets got stripped pretty quickly. It's unclear whether they will ever go back to where they were. Um, probably unlikely, and but they will come back to a certain degree. But obviously, groups are investing much less uh, or fewer dollars in these areas. And the other bucket are what I call kind of legacy solutions. Um, these are also ones that are pretty costly. They tend to be service oriented, so not technology, um, having to deal with people delivering it. So they tend to be more expensive in that way. Um, these are things like biometric screening. So there's a lot of research that's been coming out about the kind of the, or what I call the original, the OG uh, employee wellness program, which was biometric screenings. You know, you bring in uh, nurses or phlebotomists into an office, everyone gets their blood drawn, they get information about their body, like that. In theory, that kind of information technology or information uh, and kind of data helps them maybe take action and to prove their health and well being. Um, very popular in the kind of 70s, which is the first. Uh, initiation of these uh, wellness programs became really popular in the 90s and 2000s as companies were, you know, really diving into employee well-being for the first time. As more and more research came out, it turns out that these solutions aren't certainly very good for the employee in terms of improving their health and well-being. And that doesn't even include thinking about the, the cost or the impact. So it doesn't make sense from like a return on investment or, or value on investment play. So what we're finding here is that Again, these more costly solutions are the ones that our people are investing less in. And so if you think about the dollars and budgets as it relates to employee wellness programs, if you're replacing services with technology, um, even though more companies may be adopting health and well-being programs, the dollars being spent could maybe stay the same or even drop in this market. But it, you know, depending on the type of provider you are, you could be in a kind of sub-segment of growth or kind of have a number of different kind of uh, tailwinds helping you accelerate your business. Another question we asked the brokers are like, what's the decision criteria here? If they're buying solutions, they're in the market uh, and looking to improve their employee health and well-being, what are the big drivers that help decide what they're going to do and what action they plan to take? Uh, no surprise here, the rising cost of benefits is has been in all five years of just concern. Companies by nature or budget conscious. So um, allowing groups to deliver something more scalably with technology over services certainly has its appeal. The other two um, that kind of accelerate in this market, so there's a big shift um, in this category here, in this category here, um, was really, I would say, reflective of kind of the tightening job market, right? So to the extent that, uh, you know, 
employees are leaving, you know, part of the great resignation or trying to find jobs that better suit them um, for careers and for kind of long-term growth, that market to hire those really talented individuals is become more and more difficult. Obviously there's greater compensation that helps attract those talents of people, but just having better benefit plans, uh, matching the interest that your employees have with the interest of the employer is also really critical. And so half the the puzzle here is to retain your existing talent. And so that's a, a big driver for how they're thinking about employee wellness programs, but also track and differentiate uh, yourself as a company from other uh, employers in the area that maybe a prospective employee is considering uh, joining. So just a, a little bit about Wellable itself. So knowing that the market is comprised of a number of different solutions, um, knowing that a holistic focus, so things around mental health and things, things of that nature are becoming more and more prevalent. We built our program in some ways, not surprisingly, around the data we're seeing in the marketplace. So for us, we kind of have what we call the wellness platform. Um, that's our really foundational program. It's a SaaS platform that by itself offers a fairly comprehensive wellness program. So it's a whole library of holistic wellness challenges. It includes a personal wellness assessment, uh, clinical event verification, everything from you know verifying your flu shot, your annual physical, as well as you know in this current environment, verifying um, COVID vaccinations and things of that nature. If an employer just launches this program, they'll be able to address multiple dimensions of health, really tackle a lot of those areas that they're trying to invest more in, as you see from the rising stars slide uh, a little bit earlier. But if they wanna go deeper, kind of offer a more full, fuller and kind of more comprehensive program, we offer a number of kind of buy ups So things like health content, so educational resources for employees, on-demand access, so um, people can access exercise videos, meditation sessions, recipes, meal planning, things of that nature. Uh, we do have a wellness services business, so that's obviously, as you can imagine, um, pretty hard, you know, fairly impacted by COVID-19. Um, and so we're in that bucket of many of the things we offer are in that bucket of the falling giants. Um, and then rewards. This is a, the one thing if you aren't familiar with employee well-being, that becomes really critical to delivering an employee wellness solution is that employers have been designed for better or worse to provide incentives uh, for employees to engage in the program. So whether that's as simple as just giving a gift card or something more complicated as doing a premium differential or things of that nature, thinking about what are the kind of monetary or maybe even non-monetary benefits that aren't related to your health um, that employers are offering employees to participate in these programs is critical to delivering a solution in this market. Great, thank you for the uh, time. Awesome, thank you so much, Nick. Wellable is full of options. I love how customizable it is. And I'm curious, just quickly, if you could tell me if there's a company out there that's thinking, oh, customizable employee wellness program seems like a great idea, but I'm not sure if it's for me. What does your ideal client usually look like? What um, factors might companies start thinking about to determine if there's someone that would be a good fit for Wellable? That's a great question. So for us, I, in many ways, we try to identify in the marketing end, what is that ideal customer? Because if we knew that we'd be targeting them heavily, our customer base is so diverse, that's really mm -hmm. hard to identify. I think it's more of a mindset of the leadership team than actually what the company does, right? So sure. like people often say, oh, you're a tech board company, uh, we're, you must have a lot of technology customers. And we do, I mean, but because they're tech board, they're young, they're interested in something digital. Um, that being said, a lot of times the management of those companies are so busy thinking of the next five years of growth, or they're looking at their employee population and say, oh, everyone looks healthy, uh, they're young, maybe we don't need the solution. So mm -hmm. it's not like a specific industry, at least in our portfolio, um, yeah. is comprising a disproportionate number, uh, but that mindset. So we often find that wellness, when it's done really well at a company, it's owned by the leadership team. So the CEO, the head of HR, they really buy into the concept that healthy employees improve the bottom line of their business. And in that scenario, it's fine individuals many times who just seen in their own personal life. Someone who has a meditation journey and understands how important it is, understands the desire and has the ability to want to commit the budget and dollars for it. Um, from our perspective, we are a comprehensive program. Um, it's very modular. No company uses every feature we offer. That's not the intention. 
um, in the program. So to the extent that someone is looking to deliver a wellness program, our ultimate goal, our vision is to be a place that maybe don't use everything we offer, but we can deliver on any type of really effective employee wellness program. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, we've had great questions in the chat. Keep them coming, everyone. Um, our next guest, our third and final guest is Oliver Ryan. He is, he's had such a fascinating career because not only did he, found, uh, he was the founder of the Social Workout Media Inc. He was the director of digital products at New York Times, but this is what gets me. He's the co-founder of Apartment Therapy, such an iconic design blog. Um, today, Oliver is the co-founder and CEO of Count It, an app that is reinventing workplace wellness by powering community fitness challenges through wearable fitness trackers, apps, and game mechanics. Hello, Oliver. Thank you for joining us today. If you could unmute your mic, please. <laughs> yep, there we go. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me unmuted. Yeah. Um, and can you see my screen just to make sure we're all we're all good? Yes. Count okay, it. great. So yeah, I um, it's it, it, my mom described my career as a checkered career. So that's that's <laughs> one way of putting it. Um, it's great to go. Uh, it's great to be here. It's also great to go right after Nick because we represent um, a kind of different take on the same, or, or at least one part of our business is one part of Nick's business. Wellable, as he said, is, is comprehensive. And I, I kind of think of him as best of breed in our industry. So mad props, Nick. And, and I, and Gabe also, I love the, I love the, the we, we try, we try to do games, but you seem to be really deep in it for, and for the right reasons. So anyway, I'm going to, I'll dive in. Um, and the way I thought I would start is to just to sort of present some of the things that we're hearing every day. So I just grabbed some customer quotes that we take. This is just from the past week. So, and, and to help, what I'm gonna do is talk about the part of the market that we work in and why I think it's growing and uh, sort of make some conclusions about what can be done and can't be done in wellness. So. The first thing to do is start with what's the problem? Why are people showing up either at our site or other sites? And so here's a streaming media company, classic example of someone who is not in HR. Look, we're a small group of people in our wellness committee. We're looking to do a fitness challenge. So they find, they, they, they Google around and they find Count It and other companies, and then they ultimately make some choice and, and choose to do it. This is an online education platform that was acquired. So it's 300 people going into a 4,000 company firm. We're trying to build team morale. Burnout is super real, especially when we're working from home. So just, you're going to start to pick up some common themes. Uh, this is a software dev company. A lot of new people have come on board, but they've literally never seen each other. Uh, they're feeling really disconnected. We're trying to find a way to make them feel like they can meet each other. So the main summary from just three random customer sort of narratives is managers are looking for ways to, to encourage bonding. That's healthy bonding. Some of them are really focused on health and some are focused on bonding. And that's, I think, a key tension for anyone out there and for all of us in the business to think about. Um, just, as a, just as a kind of montage of the kinds of companies that show up, FedEx, public school system, you know, Catholic University in France, that does not mean that Counted is a, a small company and we're not selling into you know, the HR function of global multinationals at the top level, but we are getting teams from very large companies, schools, nonprofits, anywhere from you know, a couple dozen people to hundreds of people to thousands of people. So what is this market and how big is it? Um, this is my attempt at summarizing something, which is, and if anyone is, <laughs> is following along, imagine that there is an axis in, in, in tech in this space from sort of strictly admin and healthcare on the left and on the right culture. And corporate wellness has always been stuck somewhere in the middle. As, as, as Nick explained, there are a bunch of pure healthcare things, flu shots, biometric screenings, disease management, but then there are wellness challenges and you know, um, group wellness fairs and events. And this whole world is being 
transformed by technology. So you have a $24 billion market called HR tech, which is HR dashboards. Probably anyone in, uh, in this call who is working at a company is now used to logging into managing their benefits. So in the SMB market, companies like JustWorks, uh, Insperity, and all the way up to sort of ADP and Paychex are offering HR portals, some of which offer perk-like benefits. Uh, then you have a whole variety of corporate wellness companies operating at the enterprise level and in the mid and small market. And then you have what I think is really interesting, a series of new markets popping up around employee recognition, employee feedback. I'm going to talk about those in a second. So here are some of the brands that you might hear about in employee recognition, Motivosity, bon uh, Bonusly. If you use Slack, you've heard of, you know, Hey Taco or the Donut app. These are all social forms of trying to encourage corporate culture. That's not strictly wellness, but it's on the culture side of the HR problem. And, and, the, and the people coming to um, to us anyway, wanting to do challenges are trying to solve both health and culture. So how big is the market? Well, if it's $52 billion globally, corporate wellness growing at around 7%. In the US, it's 12 billion growing even faster. Our best guess, and this is a, this is a, a bit of a back of an envelope, is that most of it is enterprise. So giant companies doing enterprise programs, and then a small amount is in the SMB market, still 20%. What are the macro trends affecting this market? Um, so going back to health and culture, um, which is what corporate wellness is, it's about health and culture. Those two things are inextricably linked. If you have a lousy culture, you typically have poor health behaviors. Um, so what's going on, and these are big trends, more and more people are working from home or remotely. That means isolation. It also means more and more sedentary lifestyles. You're just stuck at a desk all day long. Um, again, less live social contact in your life. People are living longer, which means we all need more healthcare and we need to take care of ourselves more. That's a massive trend. And nestled in amongst all of this is there's more tech that we're personal tech that we're carrying around that's generating huge amounts of personable and shareable data. So these trends are not going away, whether or not there's a pandemic or, or any other, these are, these are all things that are here to stay. So not surprisingly, the kind of industry assessment is that wellness is anticipated to uh, see long-term increased spending. So a quick look at how the players in the market break down. And this is a bit of an old slide, but I wanted to include it just to give a sense of who's in the market. And this is the market that I'm thinking about for kind of corporate wellness players. So at the enterprise level, selling full solutions, you have big players. There was a roll up of Virgin Health, Shape Up and Red Brick. You have United Healthcare's uh, product, which is Rally Health, Vitality, Limeade. Used to be that Fitbit had a had a play in this market in the challenge space for corporates, but less so these days. As you move over to the smaller market, and Nick, forgive me because I threw these things in here, and there's nothing particularly accurate except hopefully wellable is a mid market, but focusing on a complete solution. And as you go up towards strictly challenges, focusing on SMB, you get to us and a bunch of other players. So I think the summary of this is enterprise has been crowded for a while. It got a lot of venture capital and uh, it's sort of puttering along without delivering the magic, everybody's gonna be healthier in the future solution. And I think most of the innovate, a lot of the innovation is happening in the smaller market, and yet it's also smaller dollars. So the, the market is, hasn't seen an enormous amount of venture money in the last, in the recent, say five years, it did see a huge influx about 10 or 15 years ago. Corporate wellness unbundled. Um, there are a lot of things here. Uh, You've got, and these are things that Nick mentioned, uh, weight management, biometric screening, and this is on the spectrum from healthcare to culture. And when you get over to the right, you start to see the social things, health fairs, wellness challenges, and fitness classes. Let's talk about wellness challenges. Why are they interesting? And why do I think, and why do I think a lot of the players in the market 
even though they're easy to they're easy to kind of think are a lightweight. If you get into the if you talk to healthcare people, they they will say, oh look, health fitness challenges don't do a lot. They don't change health outcomes. Behavior is hard to change. All of that is true. But if you're talking about culture in an organization, challenges have some really interesting attributes. They're highly social. They reach everyone. They are healthy and they're low cost. So they, they function as a gateway drug for culture that is the tip of the spear for wellness. I just wanted to do a quick uh, sidebar uh, for those of you that are, that are still following on along at home on, uh, on what's been happening in wearable tech and why that's also a big deal. So this is the dude that invented the first pedometer in 1780. He also invented the, the, the self-winding watch. Um, whoops, what happened here? Okay, here we go. Then in 1965, uh, a, Japanese, uh, a Japanese man came up with the notion of the Manpo meter, which, which essentially was the first use of the 10,000 step challenge. In 2009, out came the Fitbit. So that's a long time since the 1700s. In 2009, also Wired ran the first story about the quantified self, Gary Wolf and Kevin Kelly. And it was the beginning, and this was a big moment for those of you that weren't there, people began to think, holy, we're, we're, we're gonna generate huge amounts of data and it's, we're gonna be able to hack our health. And it became very viral. Bunch of companies launched wearable tech, including Jawbone, Nike, and a company called Misfit. These are now collector items. None of the apps work. Try to connect to their APIs. You will not be successful. In part because this happened in 2015. Um, Apple Watch came out. The shift went from fitness trackers to smartwatches and a lot more tech, deeper pockets. Interestingly, also in 2015, the Whoop and the Aura were launched. And you would have thought they would have gotten drowned, but they've just emerged in the last few years as darlings. Um, and that's an example of tenacity. Uh, the Aura was launched by some people, three people in Finland, in Ulu, Finland in 2015. The Whoop by uh, um, a Harvard undergrad who raised 200 million from SoftBank. I guess if you get 200 million, you, you, you stick around for a while. And then you get a LeBron James endorsement. There are also 5.7 plus billion phones, smartphones in the world today. There's about 8 billion people. So that means virtually everyone in the market has a fitness tracker. These are the big four plus Garmin. And the move is all personal data being sent into one of these hub apps, Apple Health, Google Fit. Google now owns Fitbit. And the, the one that you don't recognize if you're not an Android user is Samsung. Reminder that but these apps are really designed for personal use. Although they've made attempts to move into the, so, in the direction of social, it's typically a small group of personal friends. Strava is probably, has been probably the most successful and interesting of social fitness apps. And just as a reminder of what social can get you, this is the US base in Syria where uh, people began to track uh, our GI movements based on their Strava, Strava logs. Nonetheless, Strava is still killing it. What are the requirements of a group challenge platform? And so that's coming out of, this is, this is to just remind you that there's some really deep and big technology shifts that have been occurring and they've occurred all in the last 10 to 15 years. But to be a social platform, you need to be open. You need to work with Samsung, Apple, Google. It needs to be social, it's not just personal. Because you have HR, admins who are looking to manage large-scale events. They need to have teams, they need awards, and it needs to plug into systems with single sign-on and a variety of other requirements that of sort of modern SaaS HR tech. It also needs to be affordable because this is a discretionary spend. So that looks like painless onboarding. I think in, in increasingly you need to deliver your engagement to the platforms that people are using them on. So that's not just mobile and desktop. It's also group, group tools like Slack and Microsoft Teams. As Nick said, you need incentives. You need to act, everybody has different needs. So reporting is pretty, pretty critical. It used to be that you should deliver bulk purchases on devices, but that's no longer vital. That's more, so 
in this market, what Count It does, and this gets now, I'm going to sort of pivot into a more sort of immediate and personal experience. We've really focused on fitness challenges. So we're, we're, we're sort of obsessed with trying to figure out how to engage people. And I think that's, we are, we are a smaller business than Wellable is, and then some of the other companies. Um, and, but we're product driven. So we're really focused on trying to, and I think that's an interesting, one of the things that Nick and I have spoken about in the past is, do you go broad and try to, and try to hit all the marks and, or do you go narrow? Um, and we've, we've been focusing on product. Here's the, the idea is you can connect any of those fitness trackers. You can join teams. Um, we have, you know, obviously any of these things requires a news feed. We, we, we're focused around a leaderboard so people can see how active they are versus everybody else in their company. There's a variety of different met metrics, including total activity, average activity, percent improvement. Um, there are a variety of kinds of, of team challenges as well as group journey challenges. And we have a Slack app, which has been really interesting for us. So we bring the challenge to Slack, um, allowing people not just to see their, their leaderboard, but actually if, you're, if you are out there paying attention to this, we allow users to challenge each other during the workday to get up from their desk and take a break. And it essentially functions like a poll. And you can therefore see how many people are just gonna, and it's a two to five minute break and you get points towards the challenge for doing that. We also have implemented a kind of virtual neon sign that anyone can drop into a channel to see how the company is doing that day based on the collective average activity level. So I would say that I think it's despite the fact that, you know, Fitbit came out in 2009 and quantified self is already old news. And in fact, you know, no one wants to talk about it. It's still early days for finding ways to get human beings to communicate with each other while they're sitting in their kitchen uh, and not getting exercise? How do you get them to be a little bit healthier and to create an experience that will solve all those problems that people have been calling us up about, which is how do we avoid burnout um, you know, and the negative effects of a sedentary lifestyle? I think if you think about the, the, the game that Gabe was describing, it's much more specifically targeted at an intense and very effective personal experience. Challenges are a broader reach, lighter touch. Uh, and I think of them sort of as the tip of the spear of the industry. Um, this is just a last, this is the web view. This is a company in North Carolina that did a big challenge. So you can have teams by department, by location, and they have people get pretty nuts around these things, staying up really late, walking around the block, competing till the last minute, and then getting angry at each other. <laughs> Um, for, you know, tricky sync behaviors. And I don't know if I went over or was way too short, but that's the end of the presentation. No, it was great. Thank you, Oliver. Everyone has been so generous with all of this really helpful info. So you were just saying, Oliver, that um, the fitness challenge model is kind of broad, but when you showed the grid with the four quadrants, count it was in the top corner where you weren't focusing on enterprise businesses, your customers are small, medium-sized businesses, and you're not doing what Wellable's doing with a whole menu of um, health and wellness solutions for a company. You're, you know, sticking with the health and fitness challenges. Is this a space where um, you expect to get a lot of competitors in the future? Is that part of your quadrant going to be filled up in the coming years? It's a great question. I mean, I think the, uh, the obvious and scary competitors would be coming from the consumer side. So there's, there's, there are plenty oh. of companies that have Strava groups, right? So all the cyclists in the company will have formed a Strava group. And that is effectively a corporate wellness program. It's just free. And, um, yeah. but it turns out that Strava, just as an example, hasn't shown a great deal of interest in going B2B because the truth is it is a different business. It's a different sales model. You have to start building out features for HR departments. Um, it, it begins to dilute your brand. And if what you're trying to do is focus on athletes, it, it, it's, it's, it's easy for them to say, let's not do that. Yeah. Um, so I'm not overly concerned about the big personal tech. Um, the enterprise players have to offer a kind of a laundry list of wellness programs just to get in the door to talk about sort of multi-million dollar contracts. 
So right, because they're dealing with so of, many people, such yeah. diverse needs in that company. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I think that we're playing. We, look, we we are in a early stage mode. So I'm focused on delivering a great product experience, and then you know, finding where it fits in the larger market. And that's that that is sort of resource determined as well. You know, if we if we raised a bunch of money, then perhaps we'd try to offer more services. But but both by my own disposition and uh, where where I think we can by being like I I don't I see surprisingly little innovation in the market. I think for mm. the venture world is has not been particularly interested in this business. They got burned fairly badly early on, <laughs> and so it's been left to kind of operators to try to grow within their means and innovate. And nice. Yeah, I love it. Um, okay, you know, you're talking about innovation, how this space is moving forward. We're going to dive into it. We're going to do a group Q&A. Oliver, if you could um, stop, stop sharing. sharing your screen, and if all of the other guests could turn on their cameras, we can bring you all to screen, Dan, as well. Um, and I want to dive into a few of the different sectors of the wellness economy. There's so many. Um, here we kind of have mental health, workplace wellness, and even like physical activity and fitness technology covered. So to start with mental health, I'll start with Gabe, but then um, I'll also ask for Nick and Oliver to follow up on this question about what the future is going to look like. So even in mental health, there are such diverse businesses, right? Clinical psychology all the way to sensory deprivation tanks and sound therapy. Um, Gabe, what are some of the most innovative practices that you see on the horizon of the mental health field? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, as, as a developer in this space, and especially as we see these, you know, corporate wellness platforms and things like that, some of, you know, the, the headspaces and comms have started doing their own B2B, you know, type programs and things like mm -hmm. that. But I'd be really interested to see who's going to crack the nut on being a channel and content provider to other solutions, you know, like, so I actually turned a quarter of my bedroom into a recording studio and laid down my best imitation of Andy Pudicom. But I mean, it would have been fantastic Lovely. if I could have just had a content partnership with Headspace or a content partnership with Calm, right? Now I'm reaching into the game space, which doesn't seem to be an area they're going after yet. I'm sure that they are, but they're not going after it yet. So I would love to see some of these, you know, content generation platforms just start making it easier to integrate with those solutions um, because then they can focus on generating content. And we can focus on getting it to our users. So that's wow. one thing I'd love to see. Um, the other is uh, as, oh gosh, there was a question in the chat about the metaverse. And oh, there was. <laughs> and so there's a challenge about it, the metaverse. And yeah, don't get me wrong, like uh, Helium, the product that I showed with the animal, uh, going nuts and you have to calm it down you know they've had other experiences i, I went to a vr simulation that they did this is a uh, sarah hill and jeffrey tarrant with story up i put it on and uh there was a tree that was defaced with graffiti and broken bottles and i went through a loving kindness meditation and the muse headband read that and it made a white light come out and clean the tree and it was very cool and i thought that was neat my challenge there is accessibility like i have a hard enough i the only thing that's stopping amari from being like a 5.0 experience is everyone who attacks us in the reviews for not being free. And our game is pretty damn cheap. So I'm thinking to myself, these people who are leaning in on the, the metaverse, when are the cost of VR headsets gonna come down enough to where someone with a mental health challenge can invest in that? It seems like a very high barrier to entry to me. So I would say, I would love to see these content platforms doing more channel partnerships. And I'd love to see less excitement over the metaverse i don't know i guess that's where we're <laughs> i guess that's where we're going but i'm just like i don't know the barrier to entry there just seems like a huge walled garden so like, yeah we'll you're see. not alone in that perspective there's others that want to see less excitement about the metaverse i guess yeah yeah okay um let's go to nick what do you um see as very innovative future focused technologies in the mental health space oh if you could turn on your mic please Twice now, I've forgotten to mute myself. It happens so. all the time. Poor, poor Zoom etiquette is probably the most innovative thing I can be doing. Here. <laughs> um, There's an innovation. I know of an app where you raise your hand and it unmutes <laughs> you. So anyway. So um, 
I would kind of say in two different things. I think the most futuristic stuff, which is actually things that keep me up at night and like I'm interested in like learning about, are ones we just don't realize in the employee wellness space. And that's my perspective here, right? It's like okay. in a consumer market, you can get five consumers, 10, 15, you start growing that. But if you're looking to sell into the employee wellness market, let's just take the virtual headset example. You need to find companies who are going to sponsor those technologies, right? So when we first started, um, we were selling Fitbits and Garmin's to companies because you know, we, uh, we have a very popular blog. We used to always blog about smartphone adoption. And at the time, it was like 65% because we'd go into a room and tell people this is a great concept. And they go, well, half our employees don't have smartphones yet. Uh, not everyone is people, are people going to wear Fitbit? That was like a big question we had to deal with. So for a while, you know, we were one kind of treading water, getting people to understand there's some technologies, um, adoption and interest here by the time the prevalence of smartphones were out there and Fitbits were really popular. We kind of peaked in sales and we've been going in terms of Fitbit sales going down every year, right? So the amount of companies that are willing to invest in it. So as wellness challenges take that segment that we overlap the most with, with Oliver become increasingly popular, the underlying technology needed to support that originally outside the smartphone is becoming less and less something, less of a thing that employers are going to pay for, right? And so as it relates to like, the newest things like that, we, we, you know, we actually wrote a blog last week about the metaverse and virtual headsets yeah. and yeah. how that impacts it. And it's something that employers who are, you know, passionate in terms of thinking about the future are talking about, but I don't know if many are doing, and the ones that are doing it are investing the, in the infrastructure for different reasons. Like how do I connect a fully remote workforce? That becomes interesting. Well, now I have this headset for everyone. How can I implement employee wellness around it, right? It's not the driver of it. I actually think about that from a, an Apple Watch perspective. I think the reason they were able to disrupt the market was that, oh, by the way, we can track your steps, we can track your heart rate. There's some people who are, that's the primary feature that they want, but it's all the other things that an Apple Watch can do for you that helps you want to buy it, adhere to it, and not have all the attrition problems like a Fitbit may have that's um, singularly focused around uh, physical health. But you know, not to answer, to answer your question and not answer way, I think where we feel companies are being the most effective in terms of thinking about how they improve mental health is really thinking about their policies that they're implementing. Mm-hmm. Yes, we you know whether it's a content library that we implement for meditation and things like that, or stress management resources that we offer. Those are all very important. But we find that you know there's no um, there's no recipe or solution for like hatred in the workplace that drives stress, mm-hmm. right? Um, and things like that. So to the extent that your company's trying to work you excessive hours, you're burning out, there's, the real solution is to adjust that work schedule, not so much how can I meditate myself through this. Um, and so those resources are really important, but we find that companies that are really trying to move the needle, be really effective in this, are rethinking how they work fundamentally and how that work impacts their mental health. Um, and so from our perspective, like how does that fit into our solution? We're not making flexible work policies, right? or PTO policies and things like that. We find our solution there is offering the studies, the guidance, the intelligence around why they should do these things. And then recognize when you do those, you address a big piece of the problem, but you still need the other resources because there are other reasons people are stressed out. And that's where we come in in terms of a product perspective, but we want to be that solution, understanding that our solution, our guidance, our consultation goes beyond the product that we specifically offer. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, I know you focus so much on organizational culture and I see the connection that you're drawing here that like a healthy organizational culture is creating policies, which are, well, I guess I shouldn't say they're free to make. Maybe some of these policies do cost the company money, but you know, there are things that a company can do without employing an outside entity to increase the mental well-being of their employees. Yeah. That's one thing I'll say, because we get this question a lot about like, ROI and like, are we spending money by offering time off and things? Mm. I've always come back. You should offer a wellness program for the right reasons, which is you want to be, you want people to be healthy and thrive in their life. The nice benefit is that by doing that, there are also strong financial reasons to do it. And it's just not to save money on your health insurance, you know, a healthy, happy, productive workforce benefits your bottom line. And so I view or the conversations I have with people who are thinking about launching a wellness program is this is investment to your most important asset. This is not some line item that you're trying to manage uh, on your budget. Yeah, extremely important. 
um, I feel like we could continue that conversation yeah. because Wellable also focuses on financial, you know, not literacy, but help. And that's such a huge de-stressor for employees. But anyways, I want to get to Oliver about uh, this question of mental health and um, what innovations you're seeing in the horizon when it comes to the space of mental health. Yeah. And I've been thinking about it while you were talking and probably the most interesting thing that I saw, I mean, I, you know, we're not, what we're doing with our challenges is not mental health related insofar as we, we do, I should say this, we do credit people for meditation and mindfulness and we mm-hmm. connect to, we will, we will automatically count that if it comes in from a fitness tracker. And I'm seeing more and more companies asking for holistic challenges. So they want to include mind, body and mindfulness. Um, so yes, I think it's really important. And it's, an, it's a trend that's on the, on the rise. If it's strictly from an innovation point, the thing I've seen that's most interesting and it was pre-pandemic and it was at a, a demo day sort of event hosted by Betaworks uh, in New York City. And I was just trying to figure out the name of the person, which is not going to be helpful because I don't have it right here, but I I have it in a a moment or two. But I'll tell you what it was. It it had to do with this particular company has been pioneering the use of AirBuds um, to provide support to people with specific types of issues. And in their case, it was weight loss. So for people that are dealing with significant, like, obesity issues, there are a lot of mental um, components to that. In fact, it, as I understand it, and this is just secondhand, so I'm sharing, please forgive me for the, the lack of deeper information, but um, you know, confronting life when you're very, very overweight presents a variety of challenges, and one of them is shame and problems of self-esteem. And so this particular company and this, the woman researcher who's developed it uses essentially on-demand support tidbits basically developed from her own therapy that allow people to, whenever they need to, grab a, like a moment with a trusted friend. And it turns out, and I'm doing a terrible job of explaining it, that it works really well that you know it's a little bit like i think the experience that game gabe is describing in his game except that the format is no longer staring at a screen it's hey siri yeah i need to talk right now and while you would expect that you need to talk to somebody it turns out that having a series of very targeted sort of therapeutic messages from someone you trust can actually be very effective Amazing. So I'll drop that in. I can drop that into the chat chat or share it with you. I just, it's going to take me some digging because I don't remember the person. Yeah. Yeah. But you're really drawing that connection between um, our mental space and our physical health. They're extremely connected. Um, And Oliver, if we want to dive a little more into um, the physical activity and fitness technology that Count It really focuses on, um, I'd love to know what technology you're seeing uh, in that space. What are the wearables and the smartwatches of the future going to look like? Do you have any predictions there? Yeah, so 80-20, the vast majority of people are still coming up to speed on their phone app, you know? Um, not to forget that most regular people are not running around using every aspect of their fitness tracking, you know, wearable, um, that, so that being said, the new things that we get that come up and typically come through customer support. Yes. Aura ring. Yes. Whoop. Um, a lot of the virtual cycling apps like Zwift, um, where, you know, people are beginning to, especially when people are working from home, Peloton. We, we haven't, um, all of those are typical requests. Hey, can you sync with my Peloton, you know, or I just did a, you know, ride on my Zwift. Why isn't, why, where is it? Internet um, of things, right? I want everything to connect yeah. to everything. <laughs> yeah. But the, interestingly enough, I think we're in a time of convergence. So essentially Google and Apple are inexorably, and I'll say this to be provocative, controlling the personal health app like if it's android it's google fit if it's if it's apple it's io it's you know apple health 
So everything else has to become functional. So you may still use Calm or Headspace to meditate. You might still use Strava for cycling. The only reasons to do that though is because they, perform, they do what they do better or social. And then whatever they do have to connect to a hub app that will pipe that information to any other app that they're using. So, um, so we're sort of at a place of convergence, whereas four or five years ago, there was this, nobody, everybody was, you know, Fitbit was the biggest and, and everybody was kind of on equal footing. Okay. Um, Nick, you also talked about um, wearables in, uh, you know, tangent with the mental health question. Do you have any um, insights into trends and predictions for fitness technology in the future? It's a good question. I mean, I think actually, we actually plugging my blog again, but we blog a lot about this from studies for the efficacy of employee wellness programs. And we find the studies I'm, that- I'm sorry. I'm so glad you're plugging your blog because I have been scrolling through it and the quality of that free information is amazing. So I think it's definitely worth checking out. And you have like a wellable DIY email that's like really helpful printables. It's all free. It's great. Thank you for the, the plug as well. Um, we, we blog a lot about these studies around- the efficacy of wellness programs. And you'll see, if you just take like a, a sample of them, you'll see that it's not abundantly clear that they're super effective. But if you really dive deeper into them and say, what are the specific programs they're offering because they're so diverse in what could constitute a wellness program, you'll find the ones that aren't doing so well have biometric screenings and things like that. And the ones that are struggling or kind of in the middle have like an engagement problem where people aren't adhering to the program itself. And one of the things that we talk often about, and this was, in the early days of wearables with, you know, Jawbone, which is now defunct, launched a payment integration on their, their uh, device. And I go, what's going to keep people wearing the device isn't going to be the just need to quantify their movement, their activity. Um, if that was enough, we, would, we wouldn't struggle so much with being healthy and, and well in our society. What's keeping them attached is the access to text messaging, um, payments, right? Obviously, it's nice to have a sure. time on your watch, right? Things like that. That's what makes the Apple Watch have such high adherence and high retention levels. And so in many ways, I think the advancement is not going to be around physical fitness or other dimensions uh. of health. It's going to be other technologies that have you, that create the, the barrier for you to not use that device. Now, there's all these issues with, are we overusing technology and that being put aside? Once the device is there, then you have the opportunity to maybe analyze your heart rate, think about your step count, do all these things where it's easy to say, oh, I forgot my Fitbit on my charger. And then it, you slowly forget about it, it goes into a drawer and you don't think of it. I think that's the advancement in some ways. It has nothing to do specifically with, you know, or directly with health and well-being. Um, I know we talked about this a little bit, uh, both Gabe mentioned and Oliver mentioned content. And like, I think about like, the, even take the Disney earnings yesterday, right? So if you're in like, if you're an investor and you're looking at Disney and if you look a couple of weeks ago at Netflix, you'll realize you know, two things. One is the overall theme is really content is king, but you can replicate a delivery platform, but it's really hard to replicate content. So Disney comes in with decades and decades of like Lion King and I don't know what else that, you know, they have, but they have so much stuff like that, that it makes it really, at this point, there's a strong argument to look at subscribers and the growth rates that Disney will pass Netflix in overall subscribers, maybe even as soon as the end of this year. And they started so much later. And yeah, what do you crazy. think about, yeah, you think about Calm or Headspace, like for me, I, I think social is a piece of it. And the fact that you can be social across multiple platforms, but also I think it's like in some ways a marketing thing, like does Matthew McConaughey leading my meditation make me that much healthier? Probably not, but it's a reason people go to go to Calm and things like that. So it's a reality of what we, we operate in today um, where, there are other buzz things that have to come into play to get people to adhere to it. And I don't know what the future holds. And then if I did, I'd, you know, I'd be happy to share, but it's, it's all just interesting how things are playing out. Yeah. Interesting take. Uh, Gabe, what are you thinking? Oh yeah. No, I mean, Headspace's content is so dang good. It's like, why would I, re why would I recreate that wheel? Why? Only mm -hmm. because they haven't created the channel for me to not, you know, uh, recreate that wheel. I would happily rev share. I would happily like whatever, like, you know, there, there's so much good content, especially when it comes to headspace or calm or, or mindfulness in general. Like, you know, these are, these are 4,000 year old practices that are not being repackaged by Matthew McConaughey, which is fantastic, <laughs> you know, um, it is but, fantastic. But, but I don't think we're gonna, I don't think we're gonna, you know, discover a new, a, a new innovative, uh, 
anchored breath in, in the next millennia or so. So okay. it just seems to me like, you know, we're, we're creating a lot of redundant content and it, and it would be fantastic if we could get more channels out there. Um, yeah, I, I thought I had something else with that, but no, just- um, Well, we started by talking about um, fitness technology and mm -hmm. in the gaming space, maybe that has to do with um, VR or games like Wii Tennis yeah. or Dance Dance Revolution from 1998. Absolutely. I love um, <laughs> DDR. Pump up the DDR. Uh, DDR. Um, yeah, the, um, I would say the most innovative thing I'm seeing in that space right now, aside from Helium, which I already talked about, which is using the neurofeedback peripherals, uh, is a um, project called the Insight yeah. Project, which is out of uh, Cambridge University. It's a collaboration with Ninja Theory Studios, which was acquired by Microsoft for tons of money. And that was because they created the game Senua Sacrifice, which was this very empathetic deep dive into um, a woman with psychosis. Right. Um, but they are just doing, it's all kind of black box right now, but basically it is a lot of bringing in wearables, biofeedback, neurofeedback, and like presenting content experiences measuring the effects of that. And I believe towards the process of just like scaring the absolute crap out of you and teaching you resilience. I don't know. That's my, that's my hot take on what they're doing. Um, <laughs> but the point being that there is definitely a lot of, uh, of interesting stuff going on in the biometric space. Um, I think probably from a consumer standpoint, the biggest challenge there is calibration. So like, you know, what Nick and Oliver have talked about, you know, Apple watch being such an established product, you know, people are getting calibrated very easily. Calibration is sort of an exhausting user experience. And so if you're a new company with a new wearable and I've got to do this calibration every time I want to engage with your experience, it, it, can, it can cause a lot of drop off. So that will probably be solved with machine learning, just getting faster at calibrating, I think. Mm. Um, so that's, that's what I'd say when it comes to the wearable space. Um, but going just actually, you know, why am I still talking about Nero? We have gotten further outside of that. Let's talk about physical stuff. Uh, Ring, Ring Fit. Uh, by Nintendo is a very cool uh, product on the Switch. Mm. Um, the controller is basically a fitness ring. And uh, it, it, it scolded my chair pose so much, um, but it's got, you know, it's got, it's got sensors on it. So it can tell where your body mechanics are. It's got resistance on it. So it's a strength training game. And you're kind of running in this like virtual, very highly engaging uh, kind of Mario Kart style course as you're doing your fitness workout. So um, I'm sure your downstairs neighbors will hate you, but it is very fun. <laughs> so the, the fitness ring said that your yoga chair pose was not good. Yeah. I, uh, apparently my back has not been straight and uh, yoga teachers <laughs> have just been giving me a pass, but yeah, it was like, clearly the sensor was like looking for like a perfect 90 degree angle. And I was mm. not, I don't know. I was just sitting there, like my knees just trembling, trying to get this <laughs> thing to, to tell me that I have a straight back. So all right. Good. Well, if a certified <laughs> yoga instructor can't get it right, I'm a little worried about the calibration there. Um, you're yeah, talking yeah. <laughs> about, you're talking about like this black box project with Cambridge university, our yeah. inside analyst is currently going through the PhD process at Cambridge University. Dan, hey. do you have any insight into the black box? Do you, do you know Paul Fletcher? <laughs> no, Ma Massive okay. University. I studied political science, so okay. unfortunately I never came across it. Yeah. Gabe, what's the department doing the um, project you're talking about? So if you just Google the Insight Project, that's probably going to be the most information they have out right now. But insight. just know so Insight, yes, the Insight oh, okay. Project. In fact, there is maybe a link to it in the slides that I sent you. Um, mm -hmm. Let me take a quick peek. But yeah, so it's, do it's Dr. Paul Fletcher at Cambridge, and he is working with Ninja Theory Studios. And do I have it? So I do. Yeah, so it's in the industry resources links. So okay. um, yeah, it still seems pretty early stage. Um, but the, the Senua Sacrifice game, in addition to the, the reason why it was such a cool thing was that video games in the past have not given necessarily the best picture of mental health. It's always like deranged lunatics and things like that. And so- Yeah, not helpful. Yeah, not helpful. So what they did was they, they did decide they wanted to have this protagonist be a woman with deep psychosis and hallucinating, but they were like, how can we do this in an empathetic way? So they had Paul Fletcher, who's a clinician who works with psychotic people, arrange a subject matter expert pool of people with psychosis, family members of people with psychosis. And they got, they created this very, 
360 well-rounded picture of this protagonist that really resonated with people who once suffer from the condition and people seeing it who could you know resonate with the experience so they didn't they didn't let the character be defined by their diagnosis which i think was very important um but they also just did absolutely ridiculous pioneering with like facial motion capture and all sorts of stuff and i'm wondering if they're leveraging that same technology now to get more insights into to mm. but again it's very mysterious very mysterious we'll find out yeah. what they're up to over there interesting okay dan do you have any insights into like this technology and gaming and mental health any industry knowledge there nothing in particular I, I actually had one question kind of on this gaming notion maybe for gabe and for oliver of obviously gabe this isn't apply for amaru but gamification of mental health as a way to, you know, kind of encouraging people to do things they wouldn't do otherwise. And I think for, for Oliver, the idea of using competition to bring people together in a way that seems maybe intuitively to be a bit weird. I know I'm, I'm an athlete. I know anyone that plays sports, if you're competing against someone, even if you're, you know, you're fighting in a game, you're, you know, coming together in a way and you're, you know, building community and you're building relationships. And if you guys have any thoughts on ways that, you know, gamification and competition within these sort of games can help to kind of stimulate new forms of social you know, digital communities and digital relationships in the future to help kind of work towards, you know, these goals that we're all quite interested in. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. no, I could talk about it all day. People come to mindfulness, et cetera, for so many different purposes. You know, for some, it's anxiety and depression. But for others, it's absolutely performance-based, right? I want to be more focused. You think about athletes and how they practice visualization as they go on runs and things like that to, you know, beat their personal bests and things like that. So it's a very common technique. Um, yeah, I would say, again, talking, I'm just going to be a, a uh, beating a dead horse on this channel partnership thing. Like, I mean, why isn't Calm or Headspace like providing a channel partnership to Twitch for esports uh, professionals, you know, e athletes to get them super in, their, in the zone on their games and things like that? I think that's mm. very untapped. Um, I think uh, also just in the mental game space and the e athlete space, there are a lot of um, concerns about the mental well being of those athletes. And I think, you know, catering to them would be uh, very, very important to do. Um, getting into like the, like our experience with Maru, um, yeah, it is very much a personal journey, but you know, communities still pop up around journeys. And so we have a discord community that's very active and I could absolutely see people doing accountability checks with one another. And I think that that's something that we intend to do in the future is I, I do have some resistance to going social on a self-care pet because that for all of the reasons that social media is destructive, I don't want to insert that just directly into a self-care experience. But, you know, accountability checks would be fantastic and having that, you know, um, integrated right in there. So there was one mechanic that I had in the game for a while where if it looked like you were going to lose your streak, uh, but had a strong enough bond with your pet, your pet would save your streak. Well, maybe with a network of friends, it's like if you lose your streaks, one of your friends could save your streak for you. You know, it's like that. I think like that kind of social social mechanic could definitely be excellent in that space. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, just because, yeah, you, because <laughs> let's see if I can add to that. I, I think I'll just say commonsensically, competition is usually not what clients are looking for when they're doing a, a sort of mind-body challenge. The, the, the companies that come to us and say, we want to do sort of a holistic resilience challenge, don't go for the top, you know, top of the leaderboard challenge. Um, there are certainly organizations that do ruthless competitive challenges, but they usually physical, physical activity steps and other activity. Um, and I think that's just makes sense because what you're trying to do is be supportive and competition is often doesn't feel supportive, at least of the people who are not winning. Um, and it, and it, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that, that's sort of pretty straightforward. Um, and I think one of the challenges is how do you present data around non-competitive things in a social way that doesn't become competitive, right? So how do you create a feeling of we're all in it together and a narrative of we're all in it together um, in a world that has seen, you know, and we're just as guilty as anyone or more so nothing but leaderboards for the most of their life, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think the future is less leaderboard, more communal. And, and that's true, you know, fitness tech has been, I'm 
basically obsessed with the fact that it's always been driven by community. You know, CrossFit began as a message board. That's literally all it was. Before there were CrossFit boxes all over the world, it was one guy in California posting a workout on a, you know, 1990s or early 2000s message board and everybody logging their workouts. And so many amazing sort of weight loss and exercise communities have just been in forums, you know? Like community is such a powerful thing and it's so easy to screw it up with technology. Like, it, like just give people a, a message board and they're fine. <laughs> so, yeah. Keep it that simple. Yeah, yeah. Wow, if I, I didn't can... know that CrossFit was, <laughs> its origin story was talking about yeah, it. That I mean, makes sense. He, that guy obviously had his workout and some clients, but he began posting it and then it became viral, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I could riff really briefly on that, I mean, just the, the game design of the fitness challenges could be a big, you know, boon here. So if we want to go more communal and if we want to make it feel like people aren't being left out, I mean, doing sort of team-based goals, you know, is something that could happen or also just oh, being mindful sure. of skill ceilings, right? So if skill ceiling is too high and you've got like, you know, some people who can just absolutely blow everyone else out of the water, it doesn't feel great. But, you know, like you play Mario Kart, for instance, people get very frustrated with Mario Kart because in Mario Kart, it actually has a rubber band on the race where the people in the front uh, get hit with worse items than the people in the back. And it forces everyone back into the center. And it's like this rubber mm-hmm. band that kind of keeps everyone in the race. So I wonder if there could be some interesting game design around these fitness challenges to kind of get everyone else feeling like they're in the game. Yeah. yeah, I think there totally can be. And it's, it's just challenging game as you as you know, game design is super hard. That's right. And for broader reach, you have to keep it very simple. Like people are really busy, their HR managers are like, I'm going to dump this challenge on a 1000 people for a yep. month. They don't have time to come up along learning curve, you know? Yep, absolutely. So it's a you want to try to be really smart about how you get your game mechanics in there and lure, lure them along. And, it, and mm-hmm. it's, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Keep it simple. Um, I have another prediction question. I'll go to Nick for this one. Your report, which is so thorough and insightful, talked about how employers are investing more right now in mental health, telemedicine, stress management, mindfulness, and COVID vaccinations. What do you predict are going to be the next major areas of investment for employers? I think it's going to be around mental health, right? And so there, and secondly, I've it's sleep and, and uh, financial sleep. well-being. Financial okay. well-being is an area of like high interest. But I think the problem is employers run to the, the question like, well, just pay us more. And I know it's a lot more complicated <laughs> that, but it's, it's a question that they don't want to, they don't want to deal with. They, We're not going to touch it. <laughs> Yeah, give us a better matching. It's one of those things I, I I think a lot about, like I'm far, far from a game expert, but I think a lot about that as it relates to health and well-being in the employee space. And like, we have a leaderboard and things, so we're far from like being a truly gamified experience. But I think about like how the employer needs, which is where you get funded from, disrupts you from creating a really good game. Like, I don't know if you can really have a good B2B game out there because I just don't know if you're going to sell it. And then maybe you can sell it when you have a lot of users, but by the time you get a lot of users, you're just a consumer company. And right. you, as you said, you, Calm doesn't flip over because it's, it's a completely different model, sales, et cetera. So I don't know if it exists and any that's like the, the pessimistic view. And I assure you, I'm an optimist, but I, I just, yeah. that's my, my general view of it. And so I come back to like financial well-being. There's an interest to solve it. There's certainly an interest in need from the employee side. It's a topic that employees just don't want to touch. Employers don't want to touch because it opens up a lot of conversations they don't want to have. Mental health used to be that way and to a certain degree still is in many organizations. Um, if there is a silver lining in the pandemic, in many ways it exposed the flaws we have in our organizational structures. And because it exposed it so clearly, it was hard to avoid the conversations to have, right? Um, you know, going back to our blog, we used to blog a lot about how like loneliness was this ne- next epidemic that no one talks about. And then now, because of COVID and everyone's isolated in so many different ways, loneliness is a topic, you know, closely related to mental health that's that's discussed in many organizations that previously um, didn't have that discussion. So I think it's all around mental health. I think it's going to be built, if I had to say, the next three to five years of mental health. It's going to be companies recognizing that policies need to change and they're going to update their policies because they're going to recognize that the ones that are having trouble keeping employees especially the kind of younger generation employees are going to be the ones that did not update their policies. 
And then from there, I think that's where the evolution of the market begins to develop around the technologies, of which is step two. Like, is it as simple as just offering a resilience program or is it something more complicated than that? And I think that's all shaking out right now uh, for solutions for companies that do have very kind of progressive and forward thinking policies. But that's the area of the greatest interest. It's the area where everything aligns perfectly. Interest from the employee, interest from the employer and little barriers for the employer not to want to tackle it like financial well-being. Mm -hmm. Oliver, you work with a lot of companies that are looking at wellness programs. What do you see as the future of what these companies will be wanting? Um, All right, I'm just going to riff on a few things that came up listening to Nick. One is generational. You know, on the one hand, I think, and, and, you know, generational arguments are always fraught because who's to say everything is way more specific, but it does seem like younger, the, you know, Gen Z, and to some extent, I mean, millennials are no longer the, the, the youth of the company, but are requiring more work-life balance and looking for more, um, well, or just looking for more of these kinds of team building kind of benefits. Um, so on the other hand, there's a, there's a tension because I think there's also some trending towards distrust of sharing data and like a less, less inclined to just throw their data to their employer. So there there are some interesting cross currents. Um, And I'm I'm not going to completely be direct in my answer because I'm just sharing the things that were on my mind, but um, great. Yeah. One of the things I've always been interested in is, in being able to create a essentially a fitness tracker. If you think of your fitness tracking app, which is increasingly something that gives you sort of a status, your, your resting heart rate, your, your, your activity today, your stress level, that's for an individual. There's no reason that you can't generate a similar fingerprint for an organization. And that seems kind of far-fetched right now that you would be able to say, oh, you know, <laughs> what's the resting heart rate of my company? Um, or what's the stress level of my company right now? Or more importantly, when you're considering going to work for IBM or going to work for Google or Facebook, and you're, you might want to look at their health vitals. And it wouldn't be a glass door subjective review scrolling through an endless feed of people's sort of irate or overloving reviews of their company, it would actually be data driven. And so I find that interesting. In other words, a, an index of corporate wellness by company driven by literally the data that is coming off of everybody's phones. So would you be willing to share that anonymously if it was publishable in the aggregate and, and potentially not even controllable by your employer? Um, that's a good question. Is you know, is the Gen Z population that's very savvy about um, data security? Are they going to be willing to do data sharing for the greater good? That's an interesting idea, well, Gabe. What? Oh, go ahead. Well, Oliver. I just have to say, I, but yeah, I want to add. I think what is true, it seems to me, is that in a world in which everybody is used to checking out their professors on, you know, rate my teacher long before they take the class and checking out reviews of movies, restaurants, books, you know, products, like basically everyone is used to having data at this point. It seems likely to me that, you know, grades for corporations will become more data-driven and that will have to do with environmental sustainability as well as wellness and any, I mean, it is, it's not, it's not like you just check the stock price. You might wanna check other data relating to that company that's not subjective. So I think yeah. it's, it seems very likely to me that the future, the future will hold data scores for companies around wellness, but we're not, you know, there's, we're not there yet, but that's an interesting future. Yeah. Gabe, from a psychology perspective, what do you think about that idea? Yeah. Um, so we've been, uh, so yeah, before I jumped into game design. I got a, a doctorate in industrial organizational psych. I was an engagement consultant at Red Hat for a while. So I've, I've seen the types of initiatives that have, that have been out there. I agree with everyone that mental health and stress is going to continue to be the growth area. Um, I actually think it's going to get significantly worse before it gets better. Sorry about it. 
Um, the uh, one thing that I am fascinated by is the work from home phenomenon. Because I mean, you can see the executive suite here at Six Wing Studios, uh, it is my bedroom. And I think that more and more as people are being, um, you know, they want to work from home. I wonder when the companies are going to start mandating that they work from home. And I'm wondering if the companies are gonna provide any additional resources for that. Because I'll tell you, having your desk right next to your bed is not good for your sleep. Like we know that, right? And so I wonder as we get pushed more and more into our homes, when is it gonna stop? being like we chose that and when is it going to be something that's an imposition um, and I wonder if companies will actually start thinking okay well we need to provide a rent stipend so that this person can get a two bedroom instead of a one bedroom so they can keep their work and their life separate like I mean I think that that's something that could be very interesting um, but honestly um, I think Nick and Oliver I think you're hitting the nail on the head I think it comes down to organizational culture at the end of the day uh, creating a psychologically safe culture um, I am so it amazed when I see, when I, when I go through LinkedIn these days, and I see people of my age group who have regularly have tenure in organizations of, a, of under a year, a year and two months, like that kind of thing. And I realize if they're under a year, a year and two months, when did their job search start? It probably started at like nine months. You know, it's like they, they were looking for a job like that. That's how fast, how in and out people are coming in and out of, uh, out of companies because the psychological contract that companies take care of you is completely broken. Um, I can, uh, like the notion, like, what if you guarantee people, Hey, if you stick around for this amount of time, we're going to at least give you a two month severance. So you don't get fired over zoom, you know? And, uh, so you're not looking for a job while you're on the job. Yeah. Like, it's like Nick says, if you start to reestablish that culture of psychological safety, you can pay people enough just to take the concept of money off the table, paying them more doesn't necessarily help. Right. You've got to start putting the foundational, uh, how, yeah, how are we going to create these psychologically safe conditions and then work working hours and things like that. It's, it's got us, it's got to start from the top. Um, I think, how can I put this? Yeah. You can't just say, oh, I know you're working 80 hours a week. Just engage in this meditation. It'll make you feel better. Like that's not, <laughs> it's not going to do it. Um, yeah. so yeah. And, and I will say, you know, if companies start working on, it, it's like Nick said, it's, it's, it's not, if people are coming at this from the perspective of, I'm just trying to improve the bottom line of my insurance, it's not going to do it. Like the company needs to communicate to their people that we actually care about you. And that's the kind of thing that's going to keep people around and, and turn them, you know, turn them into committed, intrinsically motivated employees that are going to bring a lot of value. Otherwise they're just going to work for the weekend and jump ship in a year. So um, I think it's uh, companies can figure out whether or not that's a strategy that's working for them. Yeah. Great, man. I feel like we're just talking about the betterment of humanity or society. This is awesome. Okay. So in the interest of time, this isn't going to be my last question. This is just going to be a quick question and I'm going to try and make it fun and easy to answer quickly. Um, one audience question that has had a lot of interest is about like illegal drugs, because this is a wellness event, but I'm not going to say legal. I'm going to say, because inside has had a psychedelic event in the past, I'm going to narrow down this question to this. We've been talking about workplace wellness and mental health. So here's the question. Would mass legalization of psychedelics raise mental health in the workplace? What do you think? Let's, let's go to Oliver to start. Oh, I'm so glad I get to start this one. <laughs> Do you not want to? We can go to no, someone no, else. No, 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 no. I mean, my level of ignorance on this is fairly extreme. So I, I, I mean, I don't want to waste anyone's time with my totally like, fine. Basically, yeah. I mean, I'm a, certainly aware of the rise of microdosing. You know, mm. um, of, of I guess LSD and 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 MDMA. I I think that employers are going to run fast and far from that trend, mm. and maybe yeah. I mean, just for obvious reasons, you know? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I am framing it in terms of like workplace wellness. So, okay, let's go to Nick. What do you think? Yeah. I'll kind of echo what Oliver said, right? Not a ton of experience here, but I would think the number of companies that would offer it is very, very slim. That being said, <laughs> there are probably some companies out there that would benefit from this and there's always a market. So if you ask me, net is a good thing, probably a good thing, but I don't think it's going to mass impact. Mm -hmm. Before I throw it to Gabe, I'm going to throw it to Dan. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think there's a lot of regulatory hurdles and 
broader. I don't. I think people's attitudes about psychedelic drugs have evolved, especially in the last few years. I think over time, people are more open to these things. But I think even people that are working in the psychedelic industry, you know, they kind of see it as like a five, ten year kind of time horizon before this stuff gets anywhere near the mainstream. And the idea of someone's employer recommending they take something like that, it's like. <laughs> Even if I think Maybe not recommending, I, I, but yeah, or you know, or making it making it an option for for employees. Even if it's a net positive, you know, for people to have access to these things, especially when, you know, maybe current mental health treatments aren't working for them, that's a great thing. But I think it'll be a while before it kind of comes into the wellness space, as as we've talked about today. Right, we're talking about the wellness space, but does it also live in the not wellness space? I'm seeing uh, some prompts to you, Gabe, in the chat. Please put regulation aside in your answer. <laughs> What do you think, Gabe? Um, so I guess one, one thing to address again is like, where does the workplace end and the, and the life uh, begin at, at, at this point? But so putting regulation aside, um, we know for a fact in the research that uh, psilocybin mushrooms and MDMA in you know, controlled settings with therapists who are able to guide people through the experience, ayahuasca, can be profound in helping people really just sort of change the neural pathways in their brain in such a way that it's like if, if trauma has just been on a loop for such a long time, that person has no idea how to escape from it. You know, having just a complete redirection of their mental energy can really help them come to a solution. Um, but again, that's very being mindful of space and state and uh, stuff like that. So I think on the one hand, it's like, let, let people, let people do what, they need for their wellness. I, I definitely agree with Nick and Oliver that no one's, there's no employer that's going to be like, have you tried shrooms? I don't <laughs> think that's going to happen, but, uh, but they, you know, being accepting of it um, as a treatment uh, would be great. But also I would just like to point out that like the worst drug in the world is freaking alcohol and it flows through every organization at every event everywhere. So there's just, to me, the, the, there's a little bit of hypocrisy on that, that we're okay with just like getting everyone just absolutely obliterated drunk all the time, but then we're going to judge them if they like smoke weed to relax on the weekend. So I think we could check the alcohol and be more accepting of the psychedelics and let people do them as far as their wellness is concerned. So you choose alcohol over sugar? That's the most. Ooh. Um, yeah, I think alcohol for, I mean, yeah. I don't, just speaking from personal experience, alcohol is not good. Um, uh, caffeine is, <laughs> ca caffeine is also, you know, just from a, from a, from a sleep disruption standpoint, we've talked about yeah. the quality of sleep. Uh, yeah, we, we have no, we have no problem offering, you know, when I was in certain tech organizations, having a tap where you could drink beer at work and having sodas in the fridge all the time. I mean, like, mm, yeah, you know, I see what you mean. That, that, that's a, that's enabling, that's enabling something. Yeah. Take a closer look. Sure. I just, I can't, I have to, I have to, I have to jump in just to, because it's reminding that there is a, there was a work environment in which alcohol was, was offered. And that was the British Navy where you were, you got your ration of rum and that was a very, you, and, and in, in hard, in hard storm environments, you got a bit more rum. So in that case, you know, Maybe, maybe there is an, there is a precedent for some MDMA and certain, like I can imagine certain hedge funds and investment banks needing to just pass out. <laughs> well, in, in, in military in particular, uh, MDMA mm -hmm. therapy has shown to be very helpful in helping people integrate their trauma um, from, from military spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, but, but let's, let's think about that, right? We'll offer you more rum on worse days. So what we're basically saying is we're not trying to take away your pain. We're just trying to give you more stuff. No, absolutely not. Yeah. But right. if we still had trench warfare and we oh, just yeah. prescribed MDMA to all the people in the trenches, that would be an interesting resolution. I mean, like, yeah, is it, is it even would, possible it just to be the machine gun Christmas. down the enemy if you're just feeling like you love them? Yeah, it would just be the miracle on Christmas. I don't know if you're familiar with the Nazis and the, yeah. Mm -hmm. now, right. Not yeah. Nazis, excuse me, for World War One. Germans German. came out. Some some Christmas carols together. It's awesome. Mm. Yeah, this is it's all connected. Here we are back to that mental health conversation, which is connected to just like our workplace environment, our general environment, all of these factors that affect every part of our health. Um, I want to wrap up with a question that maybe won't be answered. Uh, specific to your company, but specific to your personal experience. And it's about behavior change. You know, this is a wellness event. I have learned so much about wellness. I know our audience has as well. And um, I'm curious about one hack that you have used that has helped behavior change in your life, something that's increased um, your wellness. Gabe, can we start with you? 
Sure. Uh, I, at one time, could boast, not true anymore, that I had cleared every Headspace content pack with the exception of pregnancy. So um, <laughs> I, I went deep on some Headspace. Uh, so yeah, that was pr profoundly transformative for me. Um, you know, it's, it was a very classically presented mindfulness instruction program. And, um, you know, we used to, in psychology, we used to think that around the age of 25 or so, your brain had congealed and you were who you were and personality was set and that's what it is. And all of the research on neuroplasticity says that's ridiculous. Like, you know, what you practice, you know, what you practice is who you become. So if you, yeah, so I can, I can't sing the praises of Headspace enough. Uh, Calm also mm. has some very wonderful content. Um, that's been, that's been transformative for me. Yeah. Great practice for behavior change that leads to healthier outcomes. Dan, can I throw it to you? What's one of those behavior change um, techniques that has helped increase your wellness? Short and sweet. Just trying not to look at my phone in the morning until I've gotten mm -hmm. enough work done where I feel justified to check my text messages or, or whatever. That's a good one. Let's throw it to Oliver. Workout, buddy. Yes. I mean, my, my, my theme is always going to be social. Like I think the, the thing that changes your behavior more than anything else is account is, is another human being or a group of humans. And if you can get yourself into that context somehow that will change how you behave. I think it's very hard to change your behavior on your own. Yeah. Well said, Nick, what about you? It kind of goes to the workout, but I think, I think it's just lower the barriers, right? So whatever it may be. So if it's, you want to drink more water, it's maybe it's hard to, to, to commit to that, but it's maybe easier to commit to always having a glass of water available on your desk and you will naturally drink more water. It's like the classic BJ Fogg example, but you can say, you know, I had a friend who like, wanted to go to the gym a ton. I thought this was a good practical example. He wouldn't shower at his house. He could only shower at the gym. That was like his rule, right? So every morning he's like, I have to shower. So he's going to go to the gym anyway. So if he's going to go all the way to the gym to take a shower, to go to work, he was going to work out more and he did. So I just say lower the barriers into ways that will unintentionally have you. It's like the, we, uh, I'm in our new office now. It's like, how do you separate common areas as far away as possible, right? Like put the printer on the other side of the office from like where the kitchen is or something like little things like that add up in, in many ways. So. Excellent. Excellent advice. You guys are all incredible, like sources of information, including personal advice. I knew that would happen. Um, thank you so much guys for sharing about your companies and your insights into the wellness industry. Um, we're going to do a little write up about this conversation in tomorrow's Inside Daily Brief newsletter. Um, Dan, for someone to sign up to that, is it inside.com slash IDB? Go to inside.com slash newsletters and you'll have all of our newsletters there. Inside Daily Brief okay. is top left one. So sign up, sign okay, up for mine. Great. Thank you. Um, and we'll have a condensed replay of this conversation on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. We will send out the link via email once we have that. Um, future events coming up. We've got a customer acquisition event February 17th and exploring alternative investments on February 24th. So go ahead and check those out at inside.com slash events. Everyone, thank you again. Amazing event. Thank you for your knowledge and for being here today. Thank you. Thanks so much. See you later. Thanks. Thanks to our audience. Bye, everybody. Bye. Should we just go to the go to slide?